In this video, we're going to dive down a little bit into how a, pa a page gets submitted back to the server. And there are a couple of different ways that that can take place. To begin, uh, let's just take a look at a simple default.asbx page, and let's add a little action to it. So I'm going to begin by adding a text box to the page, and then after the text box, I'm just going to add a couple of uh, HTML line breaks. And then below the text box, I'm going to add an ASP.NET button. Now, note here that both of these are ASP.NET controls, and we know this because they have the prefix qualifier of ASP. Notice also that we have a form control here. It's a standard form control specifying run at server. So this is a server-side implementation of the form control. Let's go ahead and run this and see what happens. Let's go to View, Source, and see the HTML markup. Now, uh, a couple of things to note here. If you're following along on your computer and View Source looks a little bit different, it's because by default, View Source in Internet Explorer uses Microsoft Notepad to display the HTML markup that currently appears in the browser instance that you're viewing. In my case, I've installed a free text editor called Notepad++ and specified that Notepad++ should be used as the default HTML viewer for Internet Explorer. And I do this for two reasons that are probably obvious to you. One is that I get syntax highlighting for HTML, which is useful, and secondly because I get uh, automatically get line numbers, which are also very useful when evaluating the generated code. So there are a couple things here. Right? So the first thing that we'll note is here in the form tag, right? Now, the run at server form tag has been translated into a client side uh, HTML form element where the method is post and the action is default.aspx. Now, default.aspx is actually the ASPX page that we're currently looking at. So, what's happened here is that the form tag has been decorated with an action attribute that says, submit back to the page that generated this HTML markup in the first place. And that's the default mechanism for ASP.NET. Although, if you wanted to, you could programmatically change this and submit to something else. Next, we've got a couple of hidden fields. Right? So here we have input type hidden. This contains view state, which we'll cover in a future video. A little bit farther down, we have another hidden field that contains event validation information. We'll also cover that in a future video. And then we have a couple of uh, HTML tags. Now these are, uh, remember, this is running in the browser, so these are no longer ASP.NET controls. These are the client-side representation of our server-side controls. One has been converted into an HTML input element of type text. That's our text box. And another has been converted into an uh, HTML input element of type submit. So this is a submit button. So submit button is a particular type of button. And what HTML understands about an input element of type submit is that when this button is clicked, the post method will be executed with the action that's specified in the action attribute. Now, we haven't implemented any server-side logic here. So uh, in order to do a little bit of tracing, let's go ahead and uh, add just a little bit of logic to our page. Let's go into design mode. I'm going to double click on the button control so I get the button click event handler. I'm not going to add any additional implementation for the button click event handler. Just know that we have an event handler now wired up to the click event uh, of our ASP.NET button control. The other thing that we want to do is I want to generate a page load event. So you can do this manually, but an easy way to do it, by the way, is just double click on the form outside of any other control. And when I do that, I get the page load event handler automatically wired up to the load event. Uh, if you're not familiar with the page load event, by the way, uh, look at a, a, a video that's a couple of videos earlier in this video series, and I enumerate through a whole collection of the common page lifecycle events and what you might use them for. So here in the page load event, let's just add a little trace to our page, and I'll do that by uh, populating the text box that we placed on our page with the current date and time. So let's say uh, text box textbox1.text equal system dot date time dot now and that's just sets the text box property of textbox1 to the current date and time 
Now let's run that. If you look at the current time, it's 10.57 and 13 seconds. If I click on the button and then we look at it again, it's now 10.57 and 19 seconds. So we're getting that post back and the page load event is handling is uh, being handled. And we're getting that post back even though we haven't implemented any logic in our button click event handler. In order to execute that click event handler, the post back has to happen. And when the post back happens, the page lifecycle executes and thereby we get the page load event fired and the page load event handler gets executed. Now, that's a straightforward way to handle postbacks because it's actually a submit action that's taking place, just the way things work with HTML. But if you started to play with the controls that are available in ASP.NET, you might realize that sometimes we want server-side logic to be executed before the user has completed their work with the form and wants to click on a submit button. For example, let's add another control to our page. Let's add a drop-down list. And we'll add some, edit, some, uh, some items. Now, of course, you could data bind this drop-down list to uh, a column in a database if you wanted to. We're just going to hard code a few here. So let's start with please choose an item. All right, so just uh, put a little text message here. And uh, let's make the value. Zero, right? So if we wanted to test against that to confirm that the user had not yet made a selection, we could do that. Now let's just add a few items. So let's say thing one and thing two. Please choose your favorite thing. Now, what if when the user makes a selection, we want to make some decisions in server-side logic and customize what the user sees in the page based on whether they've chosen thing one or thing two? Well, at display time, what the user is seeing is the markup that's sitting statically in the browser. So in order for us to execute code back on the server, a postback has to take place. But we don't want to wait for the user to explicitly click the button, the submit button. We want to dynamically change the content on the page when the user changes the value that they choose in this drop-down list. So let's see how to do that. First, I'm going to select the drop-down list, and let's look at the properties. If I scroll up a little bit, we'll find this item here, Auto Postback. By default, Auto Postback is set to false, and that's what we want by default. We don't want any time anybody changes any value in a control in the page for the page to, to post back. Every time that post back happens, remember, the life cycle fires on the, uh, on the server, so we don't want to do that uh, just randomly. Uh, we only want to do it when there's real action to take place on the server. So let's change this auto post back from false equal to true. What this means is now this control will automatically be wired so that whenever the value changes it will cause a post back to the server so that we can execute our custom logic. Let's go ahead and run this. Now to prove that it works, let's have a look here. We're at 11.01 and 15 seconds. If I choose an item, now we're at 11.01 and 23 seconds. So we're getting that auto post back, and our server-side logic is executing. But let's see how that gets implemented on the client side. Let's go ahead back into view source. Now you'll see we have some changes here. So the first couple of things that we'll notice is that we have some additional hidden fields. We have one for event arguments. Uh, and one for event target, as well as uh, last focus. And of course, view state we had previously. Right, so these are some, invi uh, some invisible variables 
that will be posted back because even though they're hidden they're still form variables that will tell us what the event target was what the event arguments are and these are important because when the when submit takes place on a page we know that the user is clicking the submit button but in order to execute server-side logic when we're doing an auto post back we're going to need to know which control on the page is responsible for causing that post back so that's what event target is for and then event argument is any additional information that we might need to send back to the server based on the fact that it is a given control that caused the post back now we also can see here that there was a whole JavaScript block that was inserted by the ASP.NET runtime. And this basically is the logic that causes the uh, submit to get fired. Now you'll notice here that we're manually calling a submit method. Now this is a standard JavaScript method that's built into the document object model. So what's actually going to get called by our code though is this bit here, this do postback passing in the event target and the event argument. Right. And of course we need to know this for the reasons that I just specified. So this is the difference between just the form being submitted and the form being submitted using do postback. We're going to need that extra information. If we scroll down just a little bit farther and we find our drop-down list, you'll note here that there is a client side event. So remember, by the time we're looking at this, we're looking at the HTML that exists in the browser instance. So this isn't server side code, this is all client side stuff. But what you'll see here is that our ASP.NET dropdown list control has been converted to an HTML dropdown list, and we've added an on change event handler. So there's an on change event that fires on the client in JavaScript for the dropdown list and then the we've set the on change action to be javascript set timeout which basically is a uh, a method that causes some action to take place after a certain period of time um, and in this case the time is zero it's going to happen right away but for certain controls you might want to wait a little bit to make sure that that's actually the action that should take place so you uh, have to account for any extraneous mouse movement for example all right, so just suffice to say that uh, the on change event for the client side drop down list calls set timeout, which immediately fires off do post back, passes in the name of the control that's causing this post back, in our case drop down list one, uh, and then any arguments. In our case, there are no arguments, so those are empty. Do post back is called here, passing in the control that's causing the postback and the arguments we're then setting the form variables so that when the postback happens they're available to us in our server-side code and then finally calling the built-in submit mechanism so this is an ASP.NET this is part of the standard document object model this is part of JavaScript right so that's how this works now this all gets inserted all of this script as well as these hidden variables get inserted because we set auto post back equal to true. Now we can call do post back any place that we want in our code. So if we want to write code manually, we can write JavaScript code that explicitly calls do post back and that's fine. The only presumption there is that this code has been generated by some auto post back uh, property being set to true somewhere in our web page. Now if that's not the case, don't despair, you still can manually do all of this. So for example, I have here a test page, right? and you'll notice what I've done here is, notice we're not in the browser anymore, we're just in Visual Web Developer, but I've added that, that code statically. So this is familiar code to you, we just looked at it as being automatically inserted by the ASP.NET runtime because I had set auto post back on the dropdown list to be true, but in this case, Let's look. Notice there's no drop down list in this control. All I have is a plain HTML button and a plain HTML image tag. But here in my code, sorry, wrong page. Uh, here in my code, I've 
added this jo this JavaScript. I've also added the hidden target and argument fields. So I've done this manually. And down here, I've got some standard HTML tags. And I have a couple of things that take place here. One is, on the click event for my HTML button, I'm manually calling the do postback method that I've implemented here. And do postback calls the double underscore do postback method with the event target and argument, just like we saw automatically inserted. So this is just a, a, a wrapper. Now notice, I have to specify a control that is the target. And this is necessary because it's expected by the declaration of the double underscore do postback function. Right. So uh, in our case, I've inserted button one. Now one of the things to note, however, is that uh, it may actually not be button one. So um, calling this do postback method, I'm statically coding this, uh, but I can actually call this from anywhere. So it's up to you and your code to maintain the integrity of the event target uh, argument if that's uh, if it's necessary for your application. So the other thing I've done down here by the way is I've added in this standard HTML image tag I've added an on mouse out event handler so when somebody scrolls their mouse into there when they leave there this JavaScript uh, function will be called and remember that's our do postback so what should happen here is when I drag my mouse across this image file logo.png when the mouse leaves the image I should uh, I should fire a postback to my page, right? So we're not depending the on the ASP.NET runtime to insert this stuff. Um, we've just added it manually, writing JavaScript in our ASP.NET page. Let's go ahead and run this and see how it works. So again, take a look. We've got our trace. It's 11:09 uh, and 11 seconds. If I click on this button, right now we've got 11:09 and 18 seconds. But let's also see what happens when I drag across the ASP.NET logo. So I'm in. Let's see what happens when I go out. Ah, note. We had an update, 11.09 and 30 seconds. Let's do it again. 11.09 and 37 seconds. So uh, I've hardwired some JavaScript to do what ASP.NET was doing for us automatically when we set auto post back equal to true. Now, one caveat here. If at some later point in this web form, I insert a control and set auto post back equal to true, then I don't need this statically defined JavaScript or these hidden fields anymore because the ASP.NET runtime will automatically generate for them, generate them for me. So I want to make sure that the ASP.NET runtime is not inserting this code if I'm going to insert it manually. But uh, that gives you an idea of sort of three different ways that we can handle postback. One is, of course, just using the form submit actions, which happen in HTML forms by default. The second is by using uh, the auto postback attribute in lots of the controls that are available in ASP.NET. And then, if we're not using auto postback, but we want to, in our JavaScript code, manually post back for some reason, we can do that using the mechanism that I showed you here in this page. So hopefully that helps you develop an understanding of how the page gets submitted back to the server, the different ways that that can happen, so that we can execute custom logic on our, ser on our server side code in Visual Basic or in C Sharp and update the page that the user is seeing displayed in the browser.